Welcome to Moments with Mary Ann. This is your host, Mary Ann Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Dr. Ifat Chukhev, who's here to share with us her new book, The Promise We Made, Three Universal Soul Promises We Made to Our Children, Near-Death Experience, and the Parenting Teachings It Invites. So have you ever wondered about the profound spiritual connection between you and your children? Well, today's guest is going to share with us just that. So Dr. Ifat Shekhev received her degree from the Israeli Institute of Technology in Social Organizational Psychology and is a Fulbright alumni. She was profoundly transformed by a near-fatal car crash and simultaneously near-death experience. Drawing from the insights of her afterlife encounter, she infuses the beauty and wisdom gained into her roles as mother, writer, teacher, and healer. Guiding both her own family and numerous clients, Dr. Shakef invites parents to rediscover their soul's purpose and shared agreements. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. Ifat Shakef. Hi, Mariana. Thank you for having me. Well, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about the promise we made. So I guess the best place to start is from the beginning. So I know you had a very profound NDE. Can you share that with us? Sure. It was a regular morning uh, for that time in our lives. My toddler was uh, a little over three and my twins were 13 months old. And that morning was, uh, I was teaching for one uh, morning a week, and the rest of the time I was with my uh, babies at home. And uh, rainy morning, there's not much rain here, so it was more like a drizzle, and uh, everything was shining really, really beautiful. I nursed my twins, I uh, dressed up for teaching, and um, Got out out of my uh, very home, homey uh, uh, mother motherly clothing and uh, and took my toddler to her daycare. I had a lot of time, so I remember staying there and saying and chatting with a friend and and then um, as I uh, my first memory, which was different, was uh, it took me a long time to turn left out of the village into the main road which is usually takes seconds. And the next thing I remember is a sense of a boom. It's like a sense. I, don't, I can't even explain it. I don't remember the other car. The other car slipped to the right and fixed to the left into me. And the other driver was wounded uh, as well. She, sli- she fixed into me, bumped into me very, very hard, um, really serious car crash. I don't remember any of it. My my car slipped, uh, turned around. Again, nothing. All I remember, immediately after that sense of something coming, I was out of my body in the most beautiful place I've ever visited. Far away from everything that was happening um, locally, physically on earth. And at first, I was just uh, floating in luminosity, brightness, melting into something I did not remember was so beautiful. But at the same time, I knew it was familiar, like contradictory feeling. Um, I was excited. I was... uh, um curious i was just surrendering to everything that was happening to me as if it was new but it wasn't new and uh this sense of uh luminosity just holding me like really soft white clouds and brightness and um at some point turned into floating um and i was floating forward and I noticed, I remember not many, but a few vague other beings floating around me, with me, forward. I had no idea where I was floating to. I was just floating because that's what everyone was doing. And, and the sense was so expanding and embraced and, and loved that 
uh, finding words to express this, even although I wrote about it and I shared about it, I never find the right words. I'm, I'm just thrown into this experience, uh, this energy, energetic memory I have in my body. It was both, there was both really expanding, amazing quietness and silence, but it wasn't in the silence of a void. It wasn't empty. It was whole. And in the very, very distance, I, I, I remember hearing a very, very delicate sound of bells of like, or, or maybe the music of a harp. And I'm not sure if it was actually happening or if it was my sense, my inner music playing, because everything was, it was sacred stillness, calmness as I never felt before. Um, I, did, I did manage to bring this calmness back to me after I anchored the, the experience, but I don't remember feeling it in my human physical form before that um deep 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 calmness and and an inner stillness that is uh that just opens the possibility for everything another thing that was happening to me as i entered this luminous field and uh, and and was floating forward is that every piece of judgment just melted and A door to self-love, self-acceptance, being accepted as I am, being perfect as I am, opened. Again, it wasn't, these were not mental processes as I'm trying to, uh, when I'm sharing with you now, it was a sense of energetic feeling, a feeling I still hold in my sense, um, in my cells. And... So I was I was floating and, and melting into this bright, luminous, loving surrounding. Um, I, I use the word bright, but it was it would dazzle us and in, in, in we we can't see this brightness with our um, physical human eyes. Um, it's it's too much. Uh, but um, in upper worlds, in other dimensions, it's just um, it is what it is. It is love out of love. Uh, brightness out of brightness, light out of light. There is we don't need that contradictory uh, like darkness or grayness uh, to create that luminosity when we're there. The other floating beings, which I later understood were um, or were uh, souls that uh, continued on, and uh, and it was their time to leave. Were met by. Uh, Various beings that came to um, embrace them and 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 meet them. Some of, were, of them had a more uh, human shape. Others were very tall or very luminous. And I remember one that was really round. <laughs> just you know, just a piece of energy, just the quantum of energy it was. And these was these were really embracing and loving uh, meetings of. Of either uh, the soul family, uh, souls that were uh, with those beings um, in this lifetime, and uh, higher guidance. I was just happy to watch. <laughs> I was um, I wasn't thinking about anything about what was happening uh, to my body on Earth or anything. Myself just dissolved. I was just in the now. And it was just a beautiful scene, which is also very comforting in retrospect, understanding that it is going home when we leave our body. Dying is nice, maybe everything that is around it, not, not so much. The pain, the illness, uh, uh, staying here on earth and, and miss, missing the ones who left. But the actual dying is really beautiful. And, uh, and the... And the level of embracement um, is amazing, 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 amazing. There is so much love and acceptance and non-judgment there that I'm sharing this with you and I have tears in my eyes. Um, it's just so beautiful. 
at some point, those beings that were floating with me and those that um, came forward and embraced them continued forward and I got stuck. <laughs> I couldn't float forward. There was this, some barrier that was not allowing, I could not cross. And again, I wasn't occupied what it is and why did, Why are they going forward and why nobody's meeting me at that point. But it, it was what it was. Uh, just everything was so beautiful. And uh, then being, um, I noticed that someone is coming closer towards me in a very direct uh, line. And uh, at those moments and when I first started working with what it felt like. It felt like the energy of my grandfather, the father of my father. He passed away when I was uh, nine. I loved him dearly. We had an amazing connection. He was the most creative, happy person. He had a very difficult life. He was a Holocaust survivor, but he, he was just, he loved me. He <laughs> And... um I remember having that sense of love awaken within me and and knowing that I know this being coming forward and it was there is no speaking you don't speak with your with words there is speaking of of energy it's not even uh, a telepathic thoughts it's it's just communication of energy and maybe that's where the seed for the first promise truth uh, came to be Everything is as it is. Um, you just, it's expressed in, in the communication. Um, later on in, in the processes, I reconnected to my higher guidance. And I sometimes wonder, and I never got a real clear answer, but I never asked my guidance. Was it my grandfather? Was it my higher guidance who um, took the form of my grandfather and our memories to make the meeting and the and and the everything that needed to take place there more com comforting and possible for me so that I would feel safe and and loved and I I I wonder because it's uh I know that frequency <laughs> and that was um that is a frequency of my higher gardens and my higher gardens uh, that I work with now is not my grandfather. So, um, but that was my experience. I thought it, at that time, I thought it was my grandfather and I just opened up. And after the, the exchange of, 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 of love in our energetic communication, um, that being uh, who I thought was my grandfather at the time, uh, invited me to stand on a very white, large, shimmering balcony and, and view humanity, I guess that's the way to put it. It's like the earth was moving below us and at times maybe it was the balcony moving above places in earth. Sometimes we came closer to see what was happening Sometimes it was more a higher perspective, um, like the perspective of a large bird. And sometimes it was even with additional uh, planets and even a greater perspective of what was going on. And some of it was amazing to see the alternatives and choices and the um, manifestation of soul journeys within human life. And a lot of it was also very, very, very sad um, to see the noise humans as humans we need to deal with and the um, confusion. Um, so many souls um, encounter instead of walking their paths and when they do have opportunities, but they don't see the opportunities. It's like this. Uh, uh, being forced in the to the human body, and they forget their that they can be both, and they can be a weaved spiritual human being, and you don't have to adhere to every uh, dense material thought forms, action forms, behaviors, choices. 
There was a lot of pieces about children. Only later I understood that's part of my mission to bring those invitations to allow our children to be who they are. That that came only later. But I was viewing also a lot of places on earth um, and encounters and options uh, that are related to how we raise our children. And at some point, it felt like days. Um, it was too much information. I was just observing the invitation to understand humanity. I'm, I, I'm still not sure I do, but it was definitely uh, something that opened my perspective, changed my perspective forever, gave me answers to questions I, I was never aware I asked, um, brought me back um, open to my spiritual sense, which I still needed to integrate, but it opened up. And then after a while, again, it felt like days, but it was only a few minutes in earthly time. Um, who I saw at the time was my grandfather said that it wasn't my time and that I need to return. I wasn't asked. I wasn't, maybe I wanted to stay there. I, I, I can easily see if I was given the choice how I would have taken that exit point and maybe left. Um, but I had a mission to accomplish and I wanted to be my daughter's mother. And as he said that, was uh, an energetic communication of love, I was already floating back into my broken body that experienced multiple injuries, was bleeding um, in a be very bad um, <laughs> I was in a very bad uh, situation. So um, that that's my near-death experience. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that with us. And as you were coming back, did you see other people coming back too? Or was it just like almost instantaneous experience for you? It was an instantaneous experience for me. And I did not see other people coming back or... and. When I was also floating forward in those initial moments, um, I didn't see anyone else that could not move forward like I did. I think that's the first time I've ever heard of that experience, almost like a shared death experience in many ways where you're seeing other people make that crossover. Yeah, I haven't heard about many experiences like this either, but I have heard about some. And the ones that I did hear about were always in very fast possible deaths, like car crashes when the soul leaves the body really, really fast. Um, the other ones, I'm thinking about three and maybe four that I, yeah, four, that I heard their stories, um, like me, also did not uh, have a sense of a tunnel or or the body the 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 um the luminous body the energy just left the physical you know and and they too um had hardly any mem any memories of what happened on the physical plane as they were spending time in heaven so i understand that when you came back to your body you were kind of in and out is, is that how that happened yeah i I remember falling into my really, really painful body. And at first, there was this really nice guy <laughs> that uh, got to the car, lo car crash location. After car the car crash happened, he did not see anything. Um, his name is actually Light. <laughs> That's his real name. And... Um, He's from a neighboring village. And he uh, he was guided by the paramedics that were on the way. We live in a remote area that were on the way to just talk to me and talk to me and talk to me. And he saw the um, uh, the click connect uh, bases for the infant car seats. I had uh, three infant car seats and two of them were uh, click connect. And he was really frightened that maybe they flew out of the car because the windows and everything was broken. And he was repeatedly asking me, were there any babies with you? And trying to talk to me, say my name. And 
I heard him, but I was not able to communicate to him. He did not hear me. I was like in and out, in and out. I was, I was not able to, um, to make my body work for me. And then there was one moment that I still don't know how that happened. I came into clarity. I clearly told him my husband's name and our phone number. And I told him the name of the village, which was just 10 minutes away. And, and then I drifted out again. And at that time, I wasn't back in the luminous land of love. And, but I was floating a, a bit above my car. And I saw the paramedics come and try to put a fire at the, big, at, the, uh, at the front of the car and them taking me out. And I was seeing pieces of it. And I was coming back into my body. And trying to come back to into my body it wasn't very easy uh to be in the it was so 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 painful i couldn't have any conscious holding of it but i was around and then i was already giving uh given really really strong painkillers and i have very vague memories of my husband coming there and uh and uh, the way to the ambulance and from the ambulance to the helicopter and question one of the physicians at the hospital asked me Um, and then I was put into an induced coma for a couple of days and I wasn't, I wasn't in my body at that time. I was, and I don't have any memories from what happened, um, in the hospital. Um, I was going back to this safe place, (laughs) safe place of the, of the car crash, the, the, the safe place of the luminosity of the stillness of being being accepted and I was just absorbing and absorbing and absorbing. I was drinking from this, from this light and which was nourishing and healing my energy field before I could come back. I've heard people explain that when they are in this place out of body, it feels like they've been gone for, you know, a month or a week. Did you get that sense of time? Yes. Um First, during my near-death experience, it felt like days. I saw the day end and the sunrise and the sunset and the sunrise, and we were in another place, in another place around Earth, and we saw the sun from different uh, um, angles. And then I was back, and it was only a few minutes. So that was one piece of a very different sense of time. And, um, and then when I woke up in the hospital, when they put the anesthesia down and gave me a chance to wake up, I was then put again and again. And a few times during that time, there were some medical procedures that um, were almost not successful. And I almost got died again and I almost died again. But I, 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 I received that information later. But a lot, of ha- a lot happened during those few days. And I felt like I've been away for months. I had no sense of time. I had no sense of how many how many days passed. What happened? I I didn't even know I was in a car crash until a friend told me you were in a car crash like a, a number of repeated times, and the date and the time and what happened and how old I am, and all those pieces of information just took uh, all those uh, pieces of information that we use to. Uh, construct time as humans had no meaning at all. And as I was still with really, really strong painkillers for for a while and in the hospital, I completely lost the sense of time. And it took me a while until I found that uh, integration of being in human time, physical matter, and Still being able, which I can still do now, um, live outside of time and and explore the multidimensionality as we talk, for example. So, At what point during this experience did you come across the three universal soul promises we make to our children? So the, I think the, the seeds were planted during my near-death experience while I was, uh, based on what I saw. And especially the one about truth, knowing my own truth, because I was um, 
during the near-death experience, I was stripping from all kinds of what makes you good or not good and and learning, again, not mentally, but energetically to accept myself as I am and to embrace my own essence. Integrate, then I came back to a broken body, a long process of physical reorganization and healing. I had a multiple injuries, which means injuries in all kinds of body parts all over. Um, I needed to walk, to learn how to walk again. I needed to learn how to eat again. I so many basic functions like a baby. I was really dependent. And at the same time, I was integrating what happened. It took me a while until I could talk about the near-death experience. I feel I could, I found those people where, which I could share a little bit about it and wouldn't just, uh, want to know about the afterlife or jump to all kinds of conclusions. And um, and as I was integrating those pieces and as I was integrating what love is, and I was in, another thing that was happening in parallels that I was not participating in any of the caretaking of my daughters. I was sitting on the couch if it was a good moment and I was in bed if it was a bad moment by the time I was home or I was in physiotherapy or in other operations and weeks in the hospital. And um, I was looking, I needed to know what would make me their mother, what makes me their mother beyond the doing, which I was not doing. Through this integration and through the integration of what love is, even asking the question, what is love? You know, recognizing that the fact that I gave birth to them and did so much doing <laughs> before, which is... No judgment, no self-judgment about that. When you have three babies, you have a lot of laundry, you have a lot of feeding to do or organizing the house. It's just it's it's part of the fun and, and the beauty. Um as I was integrating everything, all those uh threads of what happened in the near death experience, what does it mean? Why do I know the things that I know and never asked about? Reorganizing my body, searching for the way to define myself for myself not even for others um those um understandings came into form and it took a while until i could give them names like in the book i give them names the promise of truth the promise of attentiveness the promise of the motion of love but it took time because i was walking and learning those promises myself i was learning how to unweave all those pieces in my life that were not my own truth. I was learning to become attentive and to listen. And it was first just happened. I would drift into light every time I closed my eyes to rest. And I was resting a lot. And then I could intentionally create those situations when I can listen to my guidance. I can listen to my heart. I can listen to what my body is telling me and learn to trust it because we. So many children, I was raised in a really loving home, but it was still a home that had his uh, um, uh, its structure and the way my parents were brought up and how they view things and how things should be. So many shoulds, as we all, we all have. And um, I was always intuitive, but I could never talk about it because that would be criticized in all kinds of ways. So I learned in a very early age that I shouldn't talk to, about my experiences. And I wasn't aware of one person that I could have asked. I learned that much later, only after my experience. And um, so I needed to walk through these. I needed to uh, learn how to be attentive. I needed to understand why attentiveness and making room for um, for listening and 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 observe how we take that away from our children in the most innocent and goodwilled intentions and actions we do as parents. Um, I needed to observe it. I needed to experience it for me to be able to construct this understanding of the promise and get the download. Um, I don't share the download in the book at, with the words that it came. I share it in my own words, but I needed to understand this. I needed to um, take apart my own truths and understand that when I have those 
soul moments, which I refer to in the promise of motion, because the promises do weave in all together. When I, I have moments when I listen to my truth and I walk my truth and I act by my truth, I have aligned moments that bring me to feel like I felt in my near-death experience, feeling my luminosity, feeling who I am, feeling my essence, being perfect and accepted and loved as I am just because I made a small choice aligned to who I am. And that small choice could be taking that extra bite of the plate or leaving out, living it. Um, it could be going to rest. It could be saying yes or no to a friend that really wanted to visit and really cares for me, but I had to cal calculate my energy because I needed to have time for my, the little energy that I started to accumulate <laughs> needed to go to for myself and to my daughters and my family. So it's, um, the seeds were planted in the near-death experience, but I needed to walk those promises before I could get the, the actual download, understand that these are promises that we make and understand why they are so, so, so important in how we raise our children, especially the spiritually aware ones. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Dr. Yifat Shekef in regards to her new book, the promise we made. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. It's one thing to become attached to your perfect home, but what do you do when that home becomes attached to you? A family in dire need of a fresh start, a mysterious house tied to the past. Buried deep within the foundation of the old Far Hill Manor lies a centuries-old secret. Dark forces or something stronger just waiting to be discovered. Caretaker, a supernatural thriller by breakout authors R.J. Albert. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest, Dr. Ifat Shekef, who's here to share with us her new book, The Promise We Made, Three Universal Soul Promises We Made to Our Children, Near-Death Experience, and the Parenting Teaching It Invites. Now, I know you said you had dropped off your toddler. Where were the twins at the time that you had the accident? The twins were at home with my mom. Um, I was mostly home with them. I wasn't working a lot of hours at that time. So just before I left for work, uh, she came over and um, and the twins was, were with her at home. Luckily, my husband were, was home at, as well. So when he got the phone call, he just told her what happened, that he doesn't know exactly the details and that he would update her. He didn't even kiss the twins and he just... <laughs> drove to the location of the car crash and joined me. But they were home. They were home. And my parents were amazing because that day they just moved in. They, My father packed their stuff. He picked up my toddler uh, at noon and he came back home and they were here for a few months with us, with, with my family. I wasn't here, but with my husband and my daughters uh, became second parents. Well, what a blessing they are, my goodness, to have that relationship and to have them there to step in and, and really be there to help. 
an amazing blessing. <laughs> we were also blessed. We, we live in an amazing community and everybody was helping. People were cooking, helping, coming to chat with my mom so she would take things out of her and not hold. And, um, and our extended family, um, it's a very community-based culture and uh, we were really, really blessed. It was um, a reminder and I, I think this is true for so many people, but we sadly need those extreme experiences to be reminded that we are loved and that we are not alone. Uh, one of the illnesses of our cultures, Western cultures, is a separation, and we're not separated. We are one. Another amazing piece was that as I was, um, you know, my parents were here, and it wasn't easy. Once I came back home from the hospital, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy on them. They left their jobs, um, left everything in their lives and were just devoted to to only my three daughters and barely had any time with the other grandchildren. And as I was exploring and realizing that I'm spiritual, I have a spirit and I'm energy. And, um, and I was realizing that my daughters were on a journey. One of the toughest pieces about that was also realizing that if I'm on a journey, and my husband is, that that was an easy piece. And my daughters are on a journey and everyone on it is on a journey that so are my parents. And in the book, The Promise We Made, I actually offer an exercise um, inviting readers to um, observe their uh, parents' luminosity, assuming they get explicit permission. And I explain about it in the book. And there is also an audio that readers can uh, download through my website to make it easier to have like a guided meditation. Um, and I think that's a really important piece because we often, we look at our children, but again, we're one and it's a whole uh, system. And my understanding of my parents' luminosity and their journey completely uh, changed our relationship. We had a very good relationship before that, but something about the reciprocity, the mutual acceptance, the ability to grow together, changed, deeply transformed. And I'm really grateful for that. Really, really grateful for that. Um, um, I feel I chose well <laughs> in choosing them as my parents. I'm very grateful for them. How long would you say it has taken, or is it still taking you time, to integrate the lessons that you had from your near-death experience? I think it took me, th there was a, a very major shift for me about five years after the car crash and the near-death experience. I was integrating the whole time. Those five years were really, really um, trying to figure things out, um, trying to understand, learning that there is something called a near-death experience and that it's so common and that people experience it. I didn't know that before that. Um, and so I think it was about five years of really massive integration. And about five years after the car crash and the near-death experience, I noticed I can med mediate healing to others at the open dimensions that I'm visiting, that I can do things for others there. And um, it was clear to me that it wasn't new wisdom, that was this wisdom existed. And that led me to study shamanic practices. And that brought a lot of order and understanding to, to how I can use my healing abilities. And, but I think at that time, five years, um, also the promises were already, I already wrote those chapters. It took me a long time until I started sharing about these understandings and, uh, and uh, having my website. And, and uh, the book has been waiting, has been written for quite a few years now and was waiting for its moment. And the right moment is, um, has come, but it's, uh, so I think the main things that came there, I integrated about, it took about five years. And now I'm integrating new things. Um, there are additional universal promises I am asked to share. And I hope that will happen soon, helping us uh, guide our children to embrace their humanity and become co-creators. So with the healing work that you do, do you 
do you are you able to get back into that place that you felt when you're out of body? And does that help for you to be able to connect, you know, to your higher self or to all that is to be able to do the healing work you do? Oh, definitely. Because what happened in the NDE that was that gates to many other dimensions just opened for me. So when I met mediate healing and using shamanic practices, I kind of go on a journey. So when we uh, learn shamanic uh, tools or like specific maps, you go to specific locations. I don't go to those places. I go to other places, which I know a lot of others do as well. I've learned that a long time, but uh, along with my work, but um, um, I go back to various healing dimensions, some of which I also experienced in my near-death experience and, and observe. So it's, uh, and I also think that the near-death experience and the perspective of, of what does it mean to die? What does it mean? What is it, our journey about? And knowing it firsthand experience, and it's a knowing. It's not believing. It's not remembering. It's not studying about. It's a knowing I carry. Really, really helps me um, be non-judgmental to my clients and see them where they are and reflect their luminosity as I do my best. Uh, so I think a lot of what I am able to do is because of the near-death experience. Everything I learned and I'm still learning gives it structure and helps me feel confident in how to offer it, how to talk about it, how to, um, um, the steps maybe, um, but that's all structure around an ability that opened up in the new death experience. And I realized that those two threads, those two questions of how I am becoming my daughter's mother and what is the essence of motherhood and how do I share my near death experience with them and living heaven and earth. The, these two questions weave together because when I am aligned to my essence, to my higher self, to who I am, not as uh, my redheaded self and uh, uh, of, of this lifetime, I feel moments of joy. It's whole joy. It's very deep joy. I, I can be doing something that is, I can be folding laundry, but it's aligned to that moment. And I'm really happy that I am able to fold laundry. So I'm, I'm grateful for those little acts. And um, and when I have such aligned moments, and it can be about the little things or about big decisions or about saying the right word or not um, ignore it, or about ignoring my phone when I'm talking to my daughter, I call these soul moments. They're aligned to the past. They're aligned to who we are. And um, and I notice that when I have these moments, I'm it's the closest that I get in my inner feeling to what I felt during my near death experience. So if I will make my life as aligned as possible, and it's not, it's never 100% and I have better days and, and days that are, I am less aligned. Um, there's also a lot of noise to deal with. And, um, and I just, I do my best and I encourage everybody else to do their best to have, as, to, to live their life as aligned as possible. Because when we are aligned, aligned, not to some, um, uh, uh, an image we think we want to cultivate, but to who we are in our essence, we uh, have moments of joy and you have one moment a day and then you have a lot of moments a, a day and then your days are full of such joy. And for me, this um, connected to my role as a mother. My role is to create those conditions that will allow my daughters to be aligned, aligned to their essence. And we're a family, so that means, as a nuclear family, that we are all, we are each we each have our own path. But in all those places where we walk together, and our uh, if something is aligned for me, deeply aligned, it will be aligned for them. If something is aligned for one of them, it will be aligned for the other family members. And and they each need different conditions, and some of their conditions are similar. And when I manage, and sometimes again, sometimes it works better. Sometimes we need to observe and stop and, and ask questions. What is the next step? What is the best now? 
uh, something changes and we need to grow in our, our Aini. And, but when they have those aligned moments, a lot of soul moments in their days, I can see the joy in their eyes. I can see the joy in what they're doing. And it's giving them tools to walk life in a way that is aligned to their own truths. So only after that, this long process um, of, of realizing all these pieces, the three promises came about nourishing the truths, the truth that we each know for ourselves, uh, cultivating attentiveness and allowing attentiveness. How many parents do you know that can watch their kid gazing and not be disturbed that they're not doing something? Gazing is so important. Just being quiet, playing uh, without any friends, letting our their imagination flow, um, um, being connected to who they are and how they see things. So attentiveness in truth, these are two promises and they come together um, because we, without being attentive, we can't hear our truths. But as parents in the modern Western world, we uh, distract our children from their truths in a very, very early stage. And then we end up, they end up as adults, like many of us that are searching for this. Who am I? What do I like to eat? What do I like to do? How do I like to serve in the world? What lessons did I came here to learn? And I haven't done that yet. And so these are two really, it's, they're so, such basic promises but in the book i go into how we distract how we can fix um why is it important um mainly with the intention of bringing awareness and trusting parents that they will each take that message into their own lives because as families we're different and our personal contracts are different i'm talking in the book about three universal promises and uh, we need to weave this into the personal promises. And the last promise is about motion. And I think this is a really important one because a child is born and they this is a huge, usually a huge soul or a very evolved beings being coming into a very dependent body. And even if we choose a personal um, characteristic of our parents, and even if we know we might be coming for to challenging life circumstances, we all wish, we all hope it's it's a hope of love, it's a hope of essence that we will be nourished, and not just uh, physically and emotionally, but also in spirit, that we would be given the condition to stay who we are. If a parent is completely unaligned to who they are. That radiates, it's like an energetic communication to the child. There is no alignment here. But if a parent is 90% not aligned, but 10% aligned and is trying, trying, even just bringing awareness to when they're aligned or not aligned, that communicates energetically a message of I'm trying and being aligned is important. And that's all those uh, youth souls in dependent little bodies need in order to take that another day and another day of staying true to who they are. And I guess that's our goal. Imagine a world where all children are aligned to their essence. All teens and adults are growing up to be aligned to their essence. And with there's so much noise around, but I still, I know I'm not, in my heart it is possible. So these are the three promises and how they came to be downloaded after a long process of integration and, uh, and a lot of uh, practicing walking my talk. Everything I share in my book, I, that's how I live. That's how I'm sharing the book only after I really, really experimented it with everything and with guiding my clients. So during this time of integration, how long would you say that it it's taken to integrate these universal soul promises? They were downloaded, I guess, about four or five years after the car crash when I was already accepting and walking and um, talking about energy and 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 
started to also explore the dimensions that opened to me to mediate healing to others. And it was at least additional three years of um, experimenting with them and talking about them with my clients and seeing the effects on kids and before I put it down into the way it is in the book now. I know that you talk about spiritually aware parenting. What is that? In addition to all other elements of parenting, it brings um, the understanding that we are on a journey and our kids are on a journey. And when we understand that our kids are on a journey, it, um, it changes our perspective, again, on the conditions we create and how we choose to guide them. And it brings it it opens a door for a reciprocal growth, respect, and love, because it's not uh, the hierarchy of uh, me being the parent and the decision maker uh, changes. I still there there are limits in my house. It's not that my girls do whatever they want, not at all. But it's uh, every decision we make or every uh, perspective or choice is is from observing and asking and with um, acceptance that they might be in um, young uh, bodies, but they have experience as energies, as as essences. And um, for most uh, families that I work with, just the understanding that their kids are on a journey as well already, already makes a huge uh, shift. Another element of spiritually aware parenting uh, is about the more practical layer of weaving tools and practices. We teach our kids that it's important to brush your teeth and it's important also to clean your energy and to nourish your energy. There are so many tools available today, um, but families... um, for some reason, it's not in every community you can just talk about it. Um, so people are searching to, for tools quietly, and uh, it takes time until people find a community. Although a lot of people are trying to weave those spiritual tools. The word aware in the definition is critical because it's that um, opening our eyes, opening our hearts, opening our energy to walk the journey differently. And it it comes along any type of parenting and we're all able to be spiritually aware in just accepting that spiritual piece. And I must say about spirituality that spirituality is not about meditations or chakras or um, other spiritual tools. The spiritual tools aid in the process. Being spiritual is walking who you are in essence. And I usually give them the 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 example of uh, of technology if a child a soul an essence came here to bring us an amazing technological development and that and we see a child constantly programming and working with their computer and liking technology that's amazing and that's that child doing what he or she came here uh, to do and it's and it's it's the most spiritual thing that that they can do. I'm not talking about uh, uh, very uh, uh, just you know watching the screens uh, passively and not not being active about it. I'm talking about active explorations, and uh, it's true for all kinds of uh, professions and 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 themes and content that we might be interested in, and kids can change that from time to time. So accepting that spirituality, observing. Um, and walking our essence and creating those conditions, that what makes a family shift from just usual parenting to becoming spiritually aware because we ask a lot of questions and we observe and we try. Now, do you help parents who are looking to move into more of a, spir- a spiritual or parenting style? Yeah. Um on my website, I have a lot of articles, a lot of uh, free resources, there are a few courses coming up, uh, trying to help weave in the tools and also help parents 
take responsibility and own and heal what they need to heal in order for them to to become who they are, their essence. Becoming who we are in our essence as parents is the only way for us to be sure we're creating the conditions our kids need because uh, we keep our, our plan, our blueprint, we keep it a secret from ourselves. So if my uh, my plan for my past for this lifetime is a secret for myself, the chances that I will know more about that of my daughters is very low. I can't really know. I can observe. I can ask. I can see what brings joy into their eyes and into their hearts and follow that. So um, one of the best things that I can do is give them the example of being attentive to my essence and to what drives me. And by giving that example, by walking my essence, I'm actually creating the conditions because They chose to come to the possible, to the promise. When a child, when a soul chooses its parents to this lifetime, they know the life circumstances. They know what needs to be healed. They know they might be coming to a lot of baggage and a lot of noise, but they do have that hope and belief that that essence that they're choosing to come to as their parent for this lifetime is able to take ownership, responsibility, and heal what's possible and walk their essence. When we walk our essence as parents, we create the conditions needed. So do we make soul contracts with our children before we incarnate here? Yes, 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 yes. We um, we have personal soul contracts, personal soul contracts that are the, per- the parent's personality, life circumstances, personal soul contract that uh, outline the invitations for the learnings and the um, teachings and, and the service and the growth that soul wishes to go through. And also, it, it's also about a lot of about uh, interactions and relationships between souls and things we might want to resolve. Those are the personal. And my book is not so much about the personal, but about, about the universal soul promises, which are contracts and agreements we make with our children before they ever come to us. It's, it's, it's inherent in the choice. Now, is the soul contracts, the three universal soul promises that we talked about, or are these different for every child? These are similar to every child. These are universal. The promise of truth, the promise of attentiveness, and the promise of of the motion of love are expectations that each soul and each being that um, are born into our world expect from their parents or the significant adults that are going to be raising them. So what are some of the common challenges you see parents struggle with as they become more spiritually aware in their parenting style? The most common challenge is about language. Many adults don't walk with the energetic, spiritual language that they need. So it's not just about opening their hearts and eyes and understanding something. Just like it was hard for me to understand that my daughters are on a journey, it's hard for many other parents. But then even after they cross that bridge and understand and wish to evolve and and guide their children, inviting a child to sit for meditation, (laughs) talking about nourishing their energy, it's a really big challenge for many, many parents. And I usually encourage um, those with young uh, children, start as young as possible. Um, Mostly as soon as we open that door, our kids um, feel relieved that they can talk about what about the unseen, about the energies that they sense, about their experiences. Um, It's us adults that are challenged. So that's uh, one, um, the language, that's one of the greatest challenges um, families face. And another big challenge is about communities. Um, Finding those families that speak the same language as we do energetically, that understand our perspective to parenting, Um, It doesn't mean that we will parent the same. It's just that perspective and observation of how we look 
at things and how we choose to evolve and what guides our choices. And there are so many families out there that are spiritually aware, but are not um, familiar or are not aware that their neighborhood, that, that their neighbors are, are exploring the same th- themes or another child in their uh, um, in the kindergarten or daycare or school. And, and, and the only way to find that community is by talking about it yourself. So you need to be open and say, I'm exploring, I'm wondering, no declarations, just um, uh, being present and showing up with the themes. And I, I often give this advice to my clients and um, it doesn't take long until I get a phone call or receive a message um, telling me, oh, I talked about it. And then this mom said, and this mom said, and this mom said, and suddenly there is a group communicating about it. And then kids can meet for um, meditations or journeying together. And this piece of community is really, really important because most of these uh, spiritually aware children don't necessarily need uh, audience or a group to explore their inner escape and to fly and journey into other dimensions. But knowing other kids that are like them is really, really significant in giving them permission to stay who they are in a world that constantly constantly puts the emphasis on the outside, on the looks, and, and not about who people are inside. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think nowadays, you know, parents are so overwhelmed with everything that is on our plate. I mean, they've got school activities. There's all these things that children are involved in and working and some parents go to school. So being away can mean a lot of different things. Yes, being away can be, mean a lot of different things. And and there are often situations when, uh, let's take an example, if 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 a mom is also the caregiver of her parents or somebody else, then she might be present, but she's preoccupied. And that also takes us away from observing, from engaging, from being with our children. But I also uh, feel that a lot of um, those demands that we feel we have as parents are based on perspective and on choices. Um, when we made it, we are a homeschooling family, a home educating family. There are all kinds of terms for that. And when we made that choice to leave the school system and to um, have our girls at home and and study at home and participate in homeschooling uh, groups and activities, a friend told me that that would require um, unraveling and 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 taking apart every social perception that um, I held from what is school about. Do children need to learn mathematics? Do children need to learn arts? Do children, uh, what age do, do they, must they read properly? Or, or even asking, do they need to read properly? Um, is being in the forest all day uh, right or wrong? Um, and when we, a lot of our answers came back to yes, mathematics is important, and uh, there are are all, all all kinds of elements in in that belief system that we broke down and we chose or chose differently. Do children need all that um, after school curriculum? Will children miss out if they're not in a sport group? Um, do children need to uh, be active all the time? Do children need a lot of friends? What is better, being popular and being part of a group and being invited to all the parties? Or maybe having two or three good soul friends that truly love you for who you are? And a lot of those uh, social definitions, educational definitions, parenting definitions, what is right, what is wrong, what is needed, is not the parents. It's like those limiting beliefs coming from the outside. Now, we all walk with them. We all internalize them. That's how we grew up. That's how our social environment 
operates and order in the social environment is important. But many of those perceptions, they're old paradigm. They are not, they do not nourish spiritually aware children. Competition, for example. Some kids are more competitive than others. Competition is nourished in the Western modern world. Is it really the right way to go? Not in my personal experience and opinion. Some kids need that uh, comparison in order to evaluate themselves. Most children flourish much more in a cooperative environment. There is a trend of cooperative games, and there is a reason why these games, uh, board games, uh, are so successful and why people like them, because it makes kids happy, and all kids can win the game, and all kids can uh, 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 get into accomplishments, and there is that piece of competition is out of the game or very minimal. So yes, there are a lot of demands. And for many families, these demands are about putting food on their table. And that makes things very, very challenging and hard. But there are a lot of pieces to that demand, to these demands that are about how parents receive what they need to give their child, what would make them a good parent. In my eyes, a good parent is a parent that walks their essence, is attentive to their truths, makes room for listening, makes room for being connected to their, their own selves, and create the conditions for their kids for the same, to be attentive, to know their truths. If the truth is about being really social, and there are kids that need that social interaction in order to explore things, because that's part of their personal agreement, then go for it. But a lot of kids, and especially spiritually aware children, don't need that. They need a quiet environment. They don't need the loud music. They can't be around a lot of people. They need really, really small classrooms in order to be able to enjoy their studies. So it's about asking questions. Who is your child? And each family is different, and each child is different. And it's weaving those universal promises of truth, attentiveness, and emotion together with the personal agreements of why my child chose me and why your child chose you and so forth. I guess I'm inviting parents to look at their parenting and just take everything apart and then choose maybe to adopt a lot of these beliefs back, but from a place of choice, not from a place because this is what everybody else is doing. When you parent from that place where you are feeling as closely connected to that love that you experienced in your NDE, do you find that you sometimes will get just spiritual advice or just advice in general that otherwise would kind of surprise you? Yeah, often. <laughs> um, my whole life is guided now. I'm very much connected since the new death experience and since uh, saying yes to the invitation, multiple yeses. I am very much connected to higher guidance, to luminous beings. And um, I get guidance for everything. And it can be as an intuition, as a knowing. And it happens also with my daughters uh, when I'm not sure about something. Th some things are just intuitive. We're all um, very tuned to ourselves. My daughters are tuned to what their truths are. And they know how to express it. So we, the communication is very flowing here. Um, but if I'm not sure about something, yes, I immediately, I just close my eyes, I get an answer, and uh, um, I'm fully guided all the time, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. You share some tips for parents that are looking to create a nurturing and conscious environment for their children? Communicate. Communicate, communicate. It's not, it's nothing spiritual. Communication is not spiritual. It's about being human. Communicate from a young age, not just ask questions, but share. For me, the key to, to, to a positive, good communication is also about sharing. The girls, uh, they know how I feel. They know what frustrates me. They know when I'm, in a, uh, I'm happy and I'm joyful and we talk. And we've done that from a very early age. And it's part of the communication in the house. So, um, And when we communicate, um, 
we know what's going on. We understand each other. Um, it's also about listening, yeah, but not just um, sharing. I had a parent once who just shared and shared and shared, and, and she didn't understand why her kids are not sharing back, but because you have to listen as well. And these, we, and you need time. You need to create time for your kids. Some, some children come knowing that the personal agreement is about a parent or both parents that are going to be very busy because they're, doing, they're, they're having this important career and service to the world. But most children do expect to have at least one adult that would actually be attentive to their needs and be present for them. I think it's such a blessing if we can show up and be that person who's attentive and tuned into our children that we can really be there for them to help them on their own spiritual journey. Yeah, and we don't have it doesn't have to be the mom or dad or biological mom or dad. It's sometimes just an adult in the area, a teacher sometimes is is the one that reflects that luminosity back to the children. And um and when we do that, we also walk our own essence. No one is um no one is supposed to be so busy, so preoccupied. Um in the noise of the world that would describe it in general, uh, we are supposed to have time to listen within um, and evolve and be together. That's part of what makes us human and part of the beauty of the human journey. Well, doctor, I mean, we can talk for hours on the promise we made book. I mean, I was just so floored when I was reading it and I, I've i learned so much from this. I, I know that we need to have another discussion on this. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about your work? So the simplest place is my uh, little corner on the web, my website. It's www.efratjukefmyname.com. And on my website, there is a lot of information, a lot of free resources, um, various ways to join my community and, and receive even deeper information, also about six additional universal promises um, being downloaded and exper- that I'm experimenting with as we talk. So that's a place, my website. Well, doctor, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you for having me. Lovely to talk to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Ifat Shakef. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, The Promise We Made, Three Universal Soul Promises We Made to Our Children. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.